Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 60th episode of the Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. And when we first started this thing, I would never believe we would actually end up doing 60 episodes of this. And it doesn't seem like it was that long ago we did the first one. It sure flies by, don't it? Like that first 60 minutes. How, how time goes. Of course, today, you know, um, Amy reminded me, she's waiting on now. What do you want to you need any notes or anything for your episodes and then oh geez that's right i thought we just did that last week but it was two weeks ago so the time has definitely flown by a uh, lot of racing going on I, we've uh, uh boone finally got in no more no rain this weekend down here that was pretty exciting um you guys lost the night you were up at 141 last week tell us about that yeah, it was uh, another awesome, uh, awesome week at 141. Other than the when they were freaking out that the tornadoes were coming at us, and we were all a little on edge and <laughs> didn't know what was going to happen. We're all out there, pretty vulnerable in the in the campers and and the race trailers and whatever. And but uh, the storm hit Lake Winnebago and kind of fizzled out, so uh, that was pretty cool. But no, it was a good a good show. Uh, you know, they did it in one day and they they adapted and. They were going to cut the pay. I'm glad they didn't do that and found a way to, to find enough money in a one day gig to, to keep it 10,000 to win. You know, uh, the guys that, that traveled from a long ways away deserve the chance to run for that. You know, they came all the way up there. So, but they made the best of it. Uh, as always, the racetrack, I mean, it's a racy little place. It, it once again had a, uh, an awesome show. So, congratulations to, to Johnny Whitman and, and Ryan Rosenau and the boys for two in a row that's a pretty pretty awesome accomplishment you know the car count i think it was at 70 or 75 you know still pretty solid group of guys there some pretty heavy Good. hitters but it's a awesome track i love going over there i missed last year because my that was when my son got hurt and and i couldn't go and uh so it's great to get back over there and see the people and we did some did some work updated some machines and and uh just trying to improve our product and we actually got a couple of the new Gen 4 machines that we dropped off there for guys to test for the next uh, month or so. We're working the bugs out of that new graphing manual machine, Ultra Force. So we're excited about where that's going. Uh, we've had some touchscreen issues getting touchscreens. So uh, we're going to convert our Gen 3 manual to the bigger touchscreen. So actually be good for the whole evolution so you can as an entry level racer with an ultra force machine now you'll be able to buy one machine of the same screen and then we can update you to the new graphing one so with the same with the same machine so as you evolve your career hopefully you keep the same machine you know the the frameworks are built so good that uh they're going to last you for probably the rest of your career so did a lot of work on that uh so it was good to get over there and get some use on that gen 4 and see where we need to go with that to make it better awesome oh that sounds all pretty cool um, we had uh, a lot of uh, uh, people let us know some congratulations to some of the rti attendees from last year roy stanley with another win uh, alex crawford picked up his fourth win of the year uh, dale cake the third having a great year he's got three wins and three runner-up finishes tim shepherd uh, uh, got his first win of the year, and these are all guys in, in Jacob uh, uh, Elthrope, number, win number four. These are all guys who are out there in Pennsylvania, uh, the RTI school in Pennsylvania. So nice to see those guys are all running really good. Of course, we had quite a few around here locally, um, and uh, Amy will publish those tomorrow on Trophy Tuesdays. And... Uh, so yeah, so that was been an exciting weekend all the way around. Uh, Jack McMurdy got his win, uh, first win this season at Boone. Uh, this is that Saturday night, and uh, of course the 11 R, my uh, my shock, highly qualified shock is assistant, Bobby's assistant, I should say, um, got won the sport mod. Uh, Braden Richards won the sport mod division in the 11 R. So. So we had a good weekend at Boone, and uh, so it was always exciting. Um, I didn't actually go this weekend. Uh, somehow or another, I come up with the brilliant idea to stay home and watch the truck race. And uh, it wasn't as big of a damage control thing as it was. 
uh, Brett Moffat stayed out on stage two and started on the front row and jumped to start, so they black flagged him. Otherwise, he was leading when they black flagged him. So that was kind of a bummer, and, uh, but uh, part of the deal. I got a cool picture from there. The uh, one of the truck teams, uh, my buddy bought a mud scraper. He was using it on the on the truck series there, so that was pretty cool. To oh, cool. Be some dirt parts transfer over to NASCAR. So yeah, well, they definitely needed it Saturday night. Dead mud everywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, I felt for those guys. And the one that you know the uh, the KBM guys, they had an ingenious deal that they learned actually from the cup guys at Bristol, their screens, instead of having a flat screen in front of the radiator, in front of the grill opening, they had a, a, a bowed one. So it was out. Well, and they, they weren't having any heating problems or any, actually the mud wasn't even sticking to it because it was, it was rounded. So it wasn't sticking to it. That was pretty ingenious. So for me, I kind of always liked those type of things that are like, way to go, guys. You got this, you're getting this dirt. They'll figure it out after all. We used to build our air boxes like that on the, on the asphalt cars, the front screen, because uh, in the fall, you'd get a lot of leaves on the racetrack. Well, then they oh. plug the grill up and same thing, like the mud, plug the grill, the car would overheat. So we'd build that box back in like two inches so that air would go up over the top of the blockage, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what they were doing. You, the air would either go above or below, but then it was open on the side, so it could still suck air in. And, and yeah. it was, I thought those guys did a, it was a pretty awesome job. Like I said, I, I thought it was fun just watching the evolution of what they were doing on some of the dirt stuff. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Well, I suppose I better get to some questions here. Uh, Paul, I'm seeing Northern Sport mod modified pull bar. How long? How long is too long? And what do you recommend for a, a tight quarter mile racetrack, medium high bank track? Well, yeah, you know, I still like that 28 inch bar. To be honest with you, uh, you know, somewhere in that. 28 to 30 inch range, I think is real neutral. Um, you know, it, it, it works real well. You get, sometimes I think if you get too long, it, it can make the car, you know, I know there's been guys that have tried multiple different things with that, but with that solid bar, I think sometimes you get too long and it, and it just, um, uh, I, I just don't know if it's as effective. Um, I haven't tried a lot of stuff, and we, we played with some 36-inch stuff, and I thought it just made the car feel lazy. Uh, we tried 24s and 20-inch stuff, and I, and I thought it made the car too erratic. So we kind of settled in that 28 to 30-inch range and seemed to be pretty good. Uh, and I think that would work very well on, on a medium high bank racetrack. I mean, it's, uh, I think that's a very good all around spot. Uh, Ryan starting spring rates for an a mod on a three eighths mile fairgrounds racetrack, dirty heat races, slick rubber feature. I uh, don't have a great relationship with my chassis builder pair of four fifties across the front. Now and a 100 left rear to 250 right rear. Um, you know, I don't think that pair of 450s is that bad. That's, that's it, it just kind of depends on, you know, like if, if you're running the, if you're running the Pinto spindles, that's probably going to be a little soft. Uh, if you're running the three piece spindles, I think that's pretty good. Uh, a lot of times we run a pair of 500s. Um, I, I think that the 500s or 450s can be on the verge of a little soft. Um, sometimes we'll run the 450 on the right front with the 500 on the left front if we feel that the racetrack's got to be a little bit tighter on the right rear. Uh, you know, we'll soften the right front up to get it over on the right front, which when you get it over on the right front, then it gets the left rear up in the air, and it also gets more side bite on the right rear. So it kind of helps the car turn getting in, but seems to get you 
you know, rod angle to get you up off the corner coming off or works pretty good. Uh, 100 and that 250, that's pretty good. You know, we've got some guys that are playing with an 80 pound spring. Uh, a lot of times we run a 125 left rear. Uh, 100 works pretty good. Uh, I, I think you're right in the ballpark. I mean, I, I, I don't uh, Well, what's your suggestions, Chad? That's pretty solid, I think. Okay. Mario, hi, guys. The rear shock coilover eliminators on the birdcage should be at the same level for one side lower than the other. What would you recommend for the correct measurements or the holes on the weir's birdcage? So I would, I'd like to see the, the left rear behind be at 7-inch drop and the right rear at a 6-inch drop. If you're at a, a shorter track, we'd probably move that left rear up to get it into the corner and let it turn a little bit quicker. Uh, but generally, I think most cars are starting at 7-inch left rear, 6-inch drop right rear. Yeah, that's that's where our stuff is at. That seems to be pretty common or it works really well for us. Um, Ryan, also, what's the best way to get involved with the industry? Would you like to work for a car builder or specifically in the modifieds? Well, Ryan, I'll tell you what, there's not a shortage of jobs out here, believe me. I mean, I don't I don't think there's a chassis builder that I know that's not we're not looking for some help. I mean, we're actually looking for some skilled help. Uh, I've had some opportunities on some guys that that uh, I think would have the potential to be, you know, long term pretty decent. The problem is, is it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, you get in a deal where you like you start repairing a, a car or whatever. It's it's pretty dirty, grindy, gritty work. It's it's not. It's not always what you call working for a chassis builder like you might think it might be. It's not a bed of roses type of career. Um, you know, the pay is pretty decent in our industry, I, I think, or I feel. Um, you know, like I said, we're, yeah, I, I'm looking for another guy that's got a lot of experience. Um, you know, Rocky and, and Aiden are doing a great job, but we just, as I was telling Chad earlier, we've got more more work than what we can actually produce right now just because those guys can't they, they can't work any harder than they're working. I mean they're they're busting their butt and uh, they were still there today when I left because uh, they're putting a stub on a car and and the, and the car owner comes over every day to see how we're doing on it to make sure we, we're still working on it. and so they're feeling the, the crunch and but uh yeah there's a lot of people looking for for help there's not a shortage of jobs by all means what would you say on how to get involved chad yeah i don't know where you're from ryan but like bob said the the chassis builders that i we do business with that are are looking for uh, guys to to weld and, and assemble cars. And, you know, if you know how to weld, you can come in and start building bumpers and building sheet metal skills. And, you know, there's no better place to learn uh, the industry than getting into the industry and working for somebody. I mean, if you have some basic skills mechanically and, you know, I mean, even if you wanted to move to Bangor here and run parts, we're, we're always looking for people. And, you know, it's a, I'd say it's a special industry because you need to kind of have a passion for racing to be involved and, and, you know, understand why we do what we do. And, uh, but it's a great industry. I mean, I've obviously I've been in it my entire life and, and I've done well and I've got a lot of great people here that, that do a great job for me. And, uh, but we're always, you're always looking for, for more people for sure. Uh, you know, the, the, the skilled worker is gone by the wayside and it's you know it's at the high school level and i think we beat this up about a year ago or whatever on the show but i mean people just don't uh, they get so much pressure to go to a four-year school and and try and be uh you know that that guy that sits at a computer but you know you got to have the skilled the electrician the plumber the fabricator and and the machinist we're we're kind of a dying breed and it's because they've taken the glamour out of it and you know, my guys make pretty decent money. Uh, I know plumbers are making good money, electrician. I mean, you can go anywhere and have a good career by going to a two-year college. 
Uh, so it's, uh, it's scary, you know, uh, uh, being a business owner, as I know that you and I have talked what we're, what we're going to see in five years, as far as the, the talent pool of fabricators and machinists. But Ryan, if you're at all interested, I would, I would dive in there with both feet and, uh, you know, just do a good job. The biggest thing is you got to show up every day. That's seems, yeah. you know, show up and be willing to work the whole day. And, you know, some of that kind of stuff, you know, the basics, but. Yeah, it's like I said, it, there's always plenty of uh, work in this industry. There's no doubt about it. Okay, Ryan, Sport Mod, just a little tight on the throttle. What's your go-to adjustment? Um, if it's a little tight on the throttle, you can put some trail in the car. Um, that's probably going to be my go-to. It depends on when you say a little tight. Because you could, you know, raise the right trailing arm, put a little more angle in the right trailing arm. The problem with that is it's going to probably free you up a little bit more on corner entry. So if you feel that you can be a little freer on corner entry, that would be what my recommendation would be, is probably putting increasing the angle in that right rear trailing arm some or putting some trail in that side. That, that would be my two go-to things. Uh, Garrett, what do you recommend for a sipe depth on a modified Wasoda Hoosier? Man, Garrett, I'm really sorry. I am not the guy to ask about that. Uh, I know some basic tire stuff, enough to work with the IMCA type stuff and the, and the uh, uh, American Racer type tire. But I'm not that familiar with that with soda Hoosier tire. Um, you know, I, I your, your best bet's going to be talking to one of those racers that do a good job. That's not a competitor of yours. That's willing to, you know, give you some guidance. Uh, those guys will help you. Um, just, just uh, yeah. I wish I could answer my answer that question, but I apologize, I can't. Uh, Matt, can you explain to me why a soft spring on the left rear of a northern sport mod is a bad thing? I get that it's not on a slider and the spring may fade faster. I would think having it on the spring versus having it floated back there. Um, you know, and I understand that it's all of that factor if a guy is a really good trail breaker where you can keep that thing up on the bar, I don't think it makes a lot of difference what spring rate you actually have in that left rear, to be honest with you. Uh, if you're one of those guys that has a little trouble with keeping it up on the, uh, you know, keeping it up on the angle of that bar and lets it fall down, then my side of the soft spring is, is I think it lets the car drop too much and then it gets the car tight all of a sudden or with a stiffer spring it doesn't drop as much uh, that's just my but when they're both floating you're correct it, it makes no difference what spring rate you have uh, and i would agree with the fact that having it loaded would definitely make more sense um, i just for the lot you know on our stuff we've tried it and I can't say that we were unsuccessful with it, but I couldn't see where we really gained a big advantage over our standard 13 inch 175 that we had that does end up with some gap. But it, it all depends, like I said, you know, in, in your shock builder, you know, he's, it depends on how your driver drives. He's going to have to have a, the right shock for that combination of the driver to, to help, you know, it's, the, the trail breaking guy is going to be really good with that soft spring and, and it's going to be an advantage for him. The guy that's not as good, uh, I think it could be a hindrance. Just my opinion. Tucker, in your opinion, what's the proper amount of rear steer in a modified and dynamic? Three inches. We go between two and three quarters and three inches seems to be that magical point. Um, 
I don't know. Anytime I've ever tried more than three inches, uh, the car just seems to get kind of out of whack and, and it makes it do some funky things in the middle of the corner. It gets it to this point where it starts to steer loose and then it goes tight on you when it loses some of that. The thing that um, I have found that when you go less than that, the problem sometimes when you go less than that, like I say, if you go to like a two and a half inch steer, now all of a sudden we're not getting over in the right front like we need to. And so that steer also has a lot to do with how the car gets on the right front. And it's that combination of how much the car gets on the right front versus the amount of steer is, is that magic combination. You know, your car, your driver might like two and seven eighths might be his magical point, but there's a magic for the driver and the car combination. There's a, that, that number is a magic number, but in answer to your question, um, you know, we're right at three inches is where we seem to be uh, on our GRT stuff seems to be pretty, pretty driver universal. Uh, okay, Matthew, what, what's a good starting point for a right rear load at right height on a USRA B mod three link spring on top of the housing? Well, that's a good question too. I'm not sure I have an answer for you on that one. Uh, I don't even know if I'd know how to measure the amount of right rear load you have. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure on that one either. That, that's a great question, Matthew. I, I don't know. I don't know. You, you know, you could, it's pretty easy to measure it when you're on a, a limiter, but I mean, the biggest thing is you, you're just going to you know, measure the height of your, the free height of your spring and uh, then measure your compressed height and multiply that times your pounds per inch. And that's going to tell you what is a good starting point. You know, I mean, I, uh, 200 pound spring, I would have to believe a good starting point is going to probably be in that 400 pound range. Uh, I don't, what would you, what would you guess, Chad? Hard to say. A lot of variables there. I would try and work with your chassis builder and see, yeah. but obviously taking your car and doing the math and figuring out where you are and documenting that in your notebook and then adjusting accordingly is, is probably a good place to start. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I think that's a very good way to put that. Ryan, with an IMC modified on weir's cages, what does going up or down on the right rear bottom side of the cage do? Up, tight, down, loose, off. Yep, the uh, the car, when you go up, the car's actually going to get a little tighter getting in, be a little tighter in the middle, and be tighter off. Definitely what said, Chad just said is exactly good. Jonathan must think you're an expert on bolts. He, I heard he must have had a problem with something like that or something. Yeah, the recommendation for foot pounds on a 604 rod bolt is tighter than what yours were coming out of the factory. Mm. I think he broke, he broke rods last week at 141. Yeah, I heard something about that. He did a great recovery. Had a good car. Um, Chris, what's your recommendation on getting more forward drive on an IMCA stock car on a super dry slick racetrack? Well, I hate to say it, but tail percentages on those cars are pretty magical um, running more angle in the right trailing arm less angle in the right rear and more on the left rear definitely is is going to be the key to traction there um, the way the rules state you can't change it on the front of the, the, the front of the trailer arm but on the rear end you can have I don't know I think three holes or something to that point uh, running that left rear, 20, 25 degrees of an angle, if you can get that, would be ideal. 
uh, putting that right rear at five degrees of angle on a real slick racetrack, and that's going to tighten you up getting in. But those cars tend to be a little bit side bite short to begin with. So having that be a little tighter getting in is definitely going to be tighter coming off. That would be my recommendation is, is adjusting those trailing arms. Um, Ryan, having a guy I'm helping that's struggling a bit off the corner, I think it's too much gear. Would you gear down to help from breaking loose or is it a crutch to, in your opinion? Well, it's kind of Jonathan a thinks you're the engine expert. What's your opinion, Chad? Well, I mean, that's kind of a loaded question. There's a lot of, lot of variables there. I mean, I've, I've taken gear away in the past to do exactly what you're talking about. And I don't, you know, is it a crutch possibly, but uh, you know, maybe there's something else that you're missing there, but uh i you, you don't think of anything as a crutch it's a no. you know, change but uh yeah i i like where you're going with that tuning with gear is is always something that you're gonna do you know all the time i would say uh so i wouldn't think that it would be a crutch but i guess it would depend on the level of of how bad it is but if you're spinning the tires taking a little gear away is gonna delay the spinning of the tires and the thing of it is, is, too, it depends a lot on the racetrack. You know, if you're on a, a like a half mile that's got big old sweeping corners, boy, that's that would be the absolute best change you could make. Yeah. If you're on a tight quarter mile racetrack, the problem is, is if you're tight, where you're going to have a tendency to break the tires loose to begin with, then taking gear away from it's going to probably make the tire spin worse. Uh, you'd almost be better off putting gear to it, run more RPMs, and have a better chance of not breaking the tires loose. But that's more on a real short stop-and-go type racetrack. Anything that's got momentum, 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 I would think, and I haven't even had nothing to drink for three weeks, man. And oh, I don't have my water. That's the problem. My tongue's getting tied. Yeah, there we go. Uh, anyway, having a guy uh, take gear away from it, you know, that I, I that's that's usually my go-to, but it's got to be more of a momentum type race track. Uh, Russ, Chad, how would we get a part idea to you? I would say the pro probably the easiest way is to go through our email. Uh, it's uh, Weir's Machine at gmail.com. Uh, you know, sketches, pictures. In our 25 years, we've had a lot of a lot of cool people come to us with great ideas. That's, you know, I think one of the things that we do better than anybody else is we we uh, give credit to the where the idea comes from, and whether it's on a bar napkin after after the races, having a cold one, or you know, uh, somebody actually machines a prototype. So. Uh, we're definitely open to that, Russ. Uh, send us uh, what you what you got going on there, or just give me a call tomorrow. We can talk about it. But... Uh, Ryan, I watched the Masters at Cedar Lake this weekend, and it looks like a lot of the USMTS cars have a crap ton of chain drop. Uh, I'm at six inches with zero indexing on the left rear, and to me it looks like those guys have a lot more. Um, how are those guys getting that huge amount of chain drop, but keeping their car in one solid attitude the whole race and not too loose on corner entry? This the stay in your own notebook thing? <laughs> yeah. So when I when we raced, I always built my bodies so that they looked weird. You know, I mean, I I'm not saying they don't have more chain drop than you. I'm just saying that uh, tune your own car. You know, watch the other cars and uh, study the other cars. But you know, just because somebody has a larger gap in their wheel well, if you look at their tire opening sitting there driving through the pits, maybe they got you know two inches more gap than you do. So it's an it's a one of them things that pitchers can be your friend and pitchers can be your enemy. And you know, looking at pitchers and looking at 
uh, race cars going around the track and studying that stuff. I mean, that's, I lived and died by that, but you also have to put it into perspective. So I would tune your car accordingly. Six inches of chain drops quite a bit. I don't know where you're measuring that. Uh, and, uh, I would always be careful of, you know, Hey, let more chain out, but Holy cow, you just steered another inch and a half and destroyed your race car. So again, it's about you and your car and what you feel and, and staying in your notebook and, and, you know, doing what's best for Ryan Smith. So, Todd, please explain what advantages one get by having a brand new chassis versus a four year old one. Uh, has the technology changed that much? Um, also, what make what what makes one chassis better than the other? Is it the technical service or the engineering? Well, the answer to your last question is by far, it's the technical service that you get. Um, you, you know, I, I mean, myself, I've tried talking to some chassis builders and been on hold for eight minutes. And I just hung up because it was like, I got my time's more valuable than that. And I realize that they're busy because they've got lots of customers too. But and that's the thing you have to consider is, you know, the, you know, you take a guy like Justin O'Brien, who's got an ungodly amount of chassis. There's only one of him to answer how many phone calls. So you can't get mad at him because he's not giving you the technical support. He's doing everything he possibly can to help everybody in the hours that he has in the day. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. The other thing is, is, you know, and it's the old adage, you know, some people like to buy something different because, you know, say you go to a racetrack and there's seven of brand X cars there and there's only one of brand B car there or whatever. Well, sometimes having the seven brand X cars, you can get more technology and because they're kind of, you know, they're racing against you, but they're still sort of on the same chassis team to the point where their they're, they're chances of them helping you are going to be better. So, you know, those are things to think about. Buying a brand new car versus a four-year-old one. Well, it's the old adage. Back when I grew up as a kid on the farm and I didn't have a wire cutters, the only way I could break a wire was to bend it enough times to the point where it finally snapped. Well, you take the chassis man, the chassis builder, and say you're running 55 shows a year on a big gumbo type tire on a heavier type racetrack, or you're running three nights a week or whatever the case is, eventually you're going to wear that car out. Now, if you're that guy that runs 12 shows, 18 shows, you know, the car that you have can easily be updated, I'm sure depending on you know, what your chassis builder says, because most generally, I mean, we update a lot of our stuff. Guys that have a limited number of nights on them, there's no reason to buy a brand new car. Uh, the car's not wore out yet. Uh, and I believe like you know, all of our stuff are Molly cars, and I think it takes 10 nights to get them cars wore in before you can ever say that they're starting to even be consistent, but then they get better as the life goes on. So. I hope that answers your question, Todd. Um, service is the key in this industry. And that's kind of like I was telling Chad before we got on the phone. That was one of the things that I was kind of, you know, frustrated today. You know, we had to turn some guys down that wanted us to help them do some stuff. And, and the problem is, is we don't have, we're so busy that we don't have enough man hours to take on any more work right now. And, uh, I'd rather have somebody upset that I couldn't do something than to do a half-assed job at it. So you, you kind of got to respect people for that too. I only built eight race cars and I realized that that wasn't for me, but you have to, you have to understand, just like you said, you know, when they get that many cars out there, they give you a good baseline and you have to, you have to stay around that base, whether it's a, a Shaw, a Rage, a Lethal. I mean, these guys, they have these baselines dialed in. And I talk to all these companies and, you know, I, I talk to, get to talk to a lot of people. And what you said about 
getting off track. I mean, you know, it's easy to make a bunch of adjustments and lose track of where you are. So it boils down to your program and believing in your chassis and believing in what you're doing as a race team and, and having a good attitude. I mean, so much of it is, is that back in the day, I blamed one of the chassis and, and, you know, it was in my head that it was junk, but there was guys winning in them. Well, it was me clearly, you know, it wasn't the chassis, you know, it was what I was doing to the chassis. So don't lose faith in whatever you got there, Todd. Uh, you know, not, I just, I'm a big believer in believing in your program and, you know, having a good attitude and a good notebook and really focusing on what you're doing. Cause I did it wrong for so many years. Well, I had a customer that was in there today and they ran real well this weekend and they have not been, they've not been very consistent, you know, this year, like they had been in years past. And he today, and I kept asking him, I said, you know, if you want us to go through the car, you know, bring it over, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we can do. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever I can do to help you, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, five today, he said, well, he said, you know, he said, like, I think we kind of got back to the basics because he said, when we went down south this winter and was racing down in Arizona, he says, we kind of got off on a little bit of a different angle, he said, and, and we kind of got back to basically what was we running about this time last year. And he said, the car was pretty good. And I said, you know, I, you got to try new things because you never know. There's might, something that can be fast, but. Well, once it's not working, like you said, going back to a baseline is good. Uh, Nick, lacking drive off the corner, what could I do to help that? Well, Nick, that's a long question. Um, lacking drive off the corner. You know, if the car's tailing out on you, that's a good indication you got too much trail in it. You need to put some lead in it. Um, depending on what kind of car you have, a four-link car, you can adjust the four links on it. Um, you know, not really knowing, Nick, what you actually have, um, it's a little hard to give you a, a much more than that leading trail thing is, is, a, is a good thing for if the car's tailing out on you coming off the corner. Uh, if the car's getting in good and rolling through the middle good, then you know you just need to make some small chassis adjustments. Uh, um, trailing arm angles uh, would help get the car off the corner better. Um, that type of stuff would be good. And sorry, I can't give you more information, but that's all I can think of with the limited information that not knowing what chassis or what kind of car you're actually running. Um, have a bent axle tube. Axle still slides in and out easily. Handling has gone away. Towed out five sixteenths of an inch at the, at the rotors. Holy moly. That would be three quarters of a mile. Um, yeah, that old adage about, you know, the people, and that's a, well, Randy, that's just a great topic because that's one of my topics that I, I can, I've watched enough race cars and I've watched enough people make changes to the car to know when a guy's got a bent axle tube. And actually, if you went down to pits and say your local racetrack has 75 cars, I'll bet you if you went down to pits and you measured every one of them, there's more than likely 40 of them have a bent axle tube. I mean, it's just, it's one of the easiest things that can get bent and it's the easiest to overlook because we were always taught back in the day that if the axles move in and out, the rear end can't be bent. Well, now there's enough play and the axle sizes have gotten smaller and there's enough things coming in and out. You can, we've had, We've had some that have been over a half an inch bent, and the axle still went in and out perfectly fine. But you could physically look at it and see that it was bent. So, yeah, five sixteenths of an inch is a, is a lot. Uh, a sixteenth of an inch, I would probably straighten. I mean, honestly, that that it's hard to tune around because what happens is you try to tune around it, then all of a sudden you get a push in the middle of the corner, and, and you just can never get the car be consistent the whole way through. Uh, 
Nick, I don't know if I can actually give you a lot more information. One of the questions, if you want to, if you could tell me what uh, type of a car, if you're running a modified or a sport mod or a hobby stock or a stock car, uh, so I know what rear suspension you're talking about. Uh, rubber biscuit pull bar. If you run the biscuits too long, will the car still have forward traction, then loose it really quick? I have no travel indicator. Well, it's possible. I mean, I, I would definitely believe that if you had any traction, you know, I, I should let you actually answer that one, Chad. It's, it, you know, it's a solid pull bar is the most traction. So if the biscuits fade and, and the pull bar gets stiff, it's more traction. But we're trying to time out that two seconds of the lap. Uh, and, you know, I don't know what you got for a bar. We, we got a a travel indicator that I think you can adapt to just about any bar, but, uh, you know, getting some data and, and knowing what you got going on or, uh, you know, I don't know whose pull bar you got. If they got a lot of nights on it, like 15 nights, I'd say you probably need to put around the biscuits in it. Uh, you know, the, the first part of the year can be hard on the pull bars because the tracks generally have more grip and you're going to travel it and beat them pucks up more. I don't know if you're a IMCA or UMP or, but yeah, definitely the, the biscuits are a lot of work depending on what kind of biscuit it is. So maintenance is key on that. Uh, and if you feel like you've lost traction, that's probably something you need to look at. Okay, you said Shaw pull bar. I don't know. I assume that's a big biscuit one, the, the big biscuit Shaw style. Uh, that Them biscuits should last quite a while. I don't know how many nights you got on it, but maybe it's just a, a simple way that you need to just put some, put some uh, biscuits in it. And, you know, you can... Yeah, that's kind of a weird build pull bar, so I don't know if our travel indicator will work on that, but, you know, you can take a piece of string and duct tape it on one tube and take a piece of string and duct tape it on the other with some Sharpie marks and then measure how much it stretches that that string. That's kind of a poor man's uh, travel indicator like I used to do back in the day on things that we didn't have uh, travel indicators made for. So uh, I would probably put a round of biscuits in it, though, depending on how many nights you got on it. And if worse come to worse, putting a couple turns of preload in it will could very well at least let you know if, if that helps it. That's telling you that the biscuits are starting to go south. Yeah. Yeah. If you put a little more preload in it and the car feels a little bit better, the yeah, biscuits are getting ready to go. If, if they're not gone already, they're ready to go. Uh, Mike's got a question. Which is the better pull bar, the Weir's pull bar or the BHE pull bar? We get that asked a lot. We sell both of them. They both win races. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to put ours in one of our cars. And I wouldn't be afraid to put one of the Chad's in. They, they, they both, the, the concept is which, which is better. It just depends on um, they both work very similar in, 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 in the make. In, in, in theory, uh, I think they're equal, in my personal opinion. Now, if you call our shop, they're going to probably try to sell you one of ours. And if you call Chad, more than likely, he's going to probably sell you one of his. But they're still, in my opinion, they're both pretty darn good pull bars. And the thing about them is, is both the pull bars don't use up biscuits very much. They run a spring, and the spring you can get a, a tremendous, unless you start coil binding that spring, which you shouldn't. I mean, if you're getting enough movement on that coil binding, and you're coil binding a spring, you've got big problems somewhere else. But if you've got that much movement, like I said, unless you coil bind the spring, the spring's going to last forever. So the biggest thing about the two that have in common is longevity. Uh, and that's one of the things that a racer wants is something he doesn't have to work on every other night or whatever the case is and change biscuits every so often. Now, it's just like any other pull bar, both of them, they will require a certain amount of maintenance to be up to snuff like they should be. And you can't forget about that. I mean, it's not something you just bolt on the car and come back 20 nights later and, well, huh, I wonder if that's still working. I mean, it's going to need some grease. It's going to need a little bit of loving care. Uh, Matt, what would you say would be acceptable amount of air pressure gain in a right rear tire? 
IMCA slick car. Gosh, if you're if you're running regular air, which you should be running nitrogen, if you're running regular air, if you're getting over three pounds of air gain, your driver's sliding the car too much. Um, you're you're going to find that air gain will come from the car actually, and people think it's because you're spinning the tire. That's not the case whatsoever. Air gain will actually come from working the sidewall. So if you know if the driver sets the car at the flag stand and it's kind of one of them three wheel jockeys that wants to load on the right rear and the right rear is underinflated by three or four pounds, that right rear is going to probably be eight pounds more because the sidewall working the sidewall is where these tires gain their heat is the majority of their heat and if the right rear tire is gaining heat that means it's not hooked up so it's the old adage that kelly shower always used to say feed the heat if the car if you got a tire that's got uh, a lot of heat in that right rear you know you need more bite in that right rear tire uh Ryan, what is the most you can get away with as the rear end bent i think you hit that with the 16th oh uh, i wouldn't i mean the 16th at the rotors that yeah i wouldn't do more than that you know it depends on where it's been at too okay say for example if your right rear is bent where it's towed out then you you got to get that a 16th of an inch to square if it's bent where the right rear is towed in, you could probably get by with an eighth of an inch because having a right rear towed in, and eh, I don't think that'd be all that bad of a deal because with, you know, when you get three inches of movement on your left rear, it, it's not going to notice that. But if it's towed out at all, uh, it's always going to try to be loose. And then when you try to tighten it up, the thing will get pushy and it'll still be loose. Matt Ruff, I don't want to hear you're too busy, Bob. I'm 10 miles from you now. Well, Matt, I don't know exactly what that means, but if you're looking for a job and you can weld and you can build bumpers, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> because evidently you must know where I'm at. So you got my address. Now, I don't usually get there till 9 o'clock, so you might have to talk to, if you get there before that, you'll have to talk to Bobby or Rocky, but I'll usually be there by 9. Aaron. Can you touch on mounting location of the chain limiter on the axle tube and how moving it in or out would affect the car? And is it the same effect on both sides? Uh, go ahead, Chad. So the where you put the, the clamp on the left rear is way, way more important than the right rear. The right rear is not going to have that much of an effect as far as picking the tire up off the track and losing losing traction. The, the left rear is critical. We like to go into the bell. Uh, if you think of that, wherever that clamp is on that axle, that's kind of your pickup point. So when you have that farther out towards the end, it takes less force to pick that tire up off the track. Uh, so we like to move that in. And as the right rear is going up and the left rear is going down, it also gives us more, uh, more travel movement at the tires. So it gives you more, let's call it wedge or traction, put in the car as the car is getting to the middle of the corner. So we like that to be slid in uh, to the bell as far as we can get uh, to get the most traction out of it. Brian, with an IMCA modified on a super slick low grip racetrack, is there a crossing point with running a stiff right rear spring to build load or a soft right rear to go for body roll? Well, keep in mind, the stiffer spring gets the weight. So in other words, when you get roll to the right rear if you've got a stiffer spring it's going to load that tire more and it's going to give you more side bite 
if you've got a softer spring, the spring is going to absorb the roll and not actually load the tire more. Now, coming off the corner, the softer spring's probably going to give you a little bit more traction because, of course, it's not loading that right rear tire as much. But getting into the corner and through the middle, that stiffer spring is going to give you more side bite. So it kind of depends on what your car is actually wanting, you know, what you want out of your race car. Uh, and, and it's kind of driver specific. I mean, some guys, some drivers aren't real fond of a stiff right rear spring, uh, you know, like a 250, 300 pound spring. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more, how would I say, uh, sensitive. Uh, the soft spring is going to be less sensitive, but it's also going to put less load on that right rear tire. Uh, Don says that he's got a show off pull bar. But you already seen that. Oops. Do you have a right rear birdcage with the option to lock and unlock to the axle tube. Yes, we do. So our standard bearing cages, we have a clamp that uh, you bolt the block to the side of the cage and then you put the clamp ring next to it and then you unbolt and bolt three bolts to the the suspension cage through the clamp to lock and unlock so you can go from four link to two link. So uh, that's a 200-17CL. If you look that up on, on the website there, it'll, it'll give you a picture of it and show you how it works. But yeah, we do have an option to lock up our bearing cages. Um, Alex wants to know, he has an IMCA stock car. What would you recommend for how much shaft to have out on the left rear shock? Will too much hike, uh, sorry, I got to move my cursor. Will too much hike cause a push from the apex off? Um, it's possible, you know, because you're getting a lot of trailing arm angle. And so now all of a sudden it's getting more traction up off the corner. Uh, so, you know, you definitely, uh, that, that might be part of it. Um, if, if you're getting a lot of roll to the right rear and you're running a stiff right rear spring, it's very possible that, you know, there, there's a side bite deal, but if it's off the corner, it's it's definitely getting too much hike shaft wise you know it's a nine inch shock and, and i don't exactly remember what imca stock car rules actually are now on that shock rule or whatever but with a nine inch shaft uh i'd recommend having six inches well on the stock car you'd probably want five out and four in I'm sorry, other way around, four out and five in so that you get the roll without it trying to lift the left rear. Three thousand pound car, three three link, weirs open style bushing bar, seven slash eighty girl bushings. Bar is set at eight and an eighth inches and travels an inch and an eighth. The car lacks traction at the end of the phase, but of phase three, but has a ton of traction at the center to the from the center to the end of the straightaway. Would a spring bar be better suited for my application? I don't think the, the bar matters. Uh, I think you maybe have it either too, uh, not enough angle. So I'd put a little bit more angle in it to time out that traction just a little bit different. If the bar is too flat, you'll have less instant and you'll have more at the end of the straightaway. Uh, so tune in the length maybe and, and the angle of that is probably going to dial that right in. Uh, the puck bar is definitely a good bar. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to, to tune that in. Maybe just a little bit less preload going an inch and a quarter, but I think location is more important tuning wise uh, than the actual bar itself most most tracks. So I would give it a little bit more angle and see if you can get that phase three dialed in. 
Oh, darn, Matt, I thought you were looking for a job, but you actually want us to set your car up. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that things will look a lot more positive in a week. Uh, we weren't. We weren't expecting the results from Brit Speedway last Monday night to cause the problems that they caused. But it destroyed one race car, which we've got to build a new one for, which luckily that's going to give us a little time because I can't get the car from GRT for a couple, three weeks. But we weren't intending on putting a stub and a tail on another car because of that uh, particular situation up there. So it kind of caught us far behind. Now trying to make excuses, and then I've got a guy from Michigan that was supposed to pick up his car today. Now he's not going to probably be here till uh, later in the week, and we're just out of shop room. We've got more cars in there that we've got room to actually work right now, so the boys are getting fancy. In fact, I'm actually going to take two new cars to the storage shed or uh, to our storage center tomorrow, so we have a little bit more room in there. Our shop's not that big, and it works very well when we can time things accordingly, but this time of the year, you know, it's unexpected. Any suggestions on Adriel? Adriel wants to know, any suggestions on measuring lining things back up when switching from a 9-inch to a quick change in a B-mod? Um, do you know what that reads? Well, I think you're talking about when you get the cages on the switching from a nine inch rear end to, to the quick change rear end. So obviously you need to get your left to right location on the cages. Correct. Uh, assuming you have a, basically a twin width of the, the rear end, uh, make sure the cages are in the same spot on a, on that kind of car on a B mod, we like to set our cages level. And then you have the pinion angle built into it. So if you're running eight degrees of pinion angle, the cages are level at ride height. So then when you make a bar adjustment, you just have to adjust the trailing arm to get the levels level. And then you automatically know your pinion angle is going to be right. As far as a J bar, I assume you are a uh, J bar in the front and not a rear panner bar. So the the pinion on a, on a quick change is higher. Inch and a quarter lower. Inch and a quarter lower than your than your nine inch. So reference where you're running the J bar and then adjust accordingly uh, with the quick change. So if you were at the center line on a Ford, you're an inch and a inch and inch a quarter and, above. Inch and a quarter above on the quick change. Yep. Uh, so that's really the main the main thing so that you get your bars towed correctly on the rear end and get your pinion angle right and, and then get your panner bar in the right location when you're when you're switching from a nine inch to a quick change. Uh, Jim's got a question, and this is actually a very good question. When scaling, have all gas shocks. He has all gas shocks. Do you unhook all, or which ones do you need to be disconnected? Uh, I always unhook my two front shocks. Biggest reason, because the right front's got a lot of zero point usually in it, and, and, and if you don't unhook it, it'll make scaling job last for freaking ever. And it'll be inconsistent because you don't know what the shock's doing. So I always unhook the front shocks. Um, rear shocks, I don't worry about the right rear because the right rear usually is a low gas pressure shock. It doesn't have a lot of valving in it, so it's pretty neutral, and it doesn't really affect it too much. The left rear, you can either leave it hooked or unhooked. What it will do, if you have a left rear gas shock, like say if your chassis manufacturer says you want to have 60 pounds of bite, with the gas shock hooked up, you would want 80 pounds because the gas shock will add 20 pounds of bite to the car in a static mode. Now, once the car hits the racetrack, it has no clue what that is the, the gas shock has no no effect on the scaling part of it whatsoever so like i said normally we'll unhook the three of them and then you know and, and that like with an a mod we've got to keep the right rear hooked up anyway uh if it's a if you're if you're running a stock car or if you're running a, a sport mod 
doesn't take that long to unhook all of them. If you do unhook all of them, it makes the scaling process go faster. How much static load should you have on the right rear when it's drive versus when the track has bite or was soda modified? Well, yeah, I'm not completely sure how to answer that one either as far as. I don't have an answer to that question. I'm sorry, Al. I, I, I don't actually change right rear static load, to be honest. Uh, I worry more about the left rear load than I do the right rear load. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually, I set that where I want it when I scale the car and, and then I, I just adjust the left rear. And actually, I don't adjust the left rear a whole lot. You put more load in the left rear, it's going to make the car freer getting in. You take load out, it's going to tighten it up a little bit. One of the things that I tell people, if you decide you need a little bit more load on the left rear, make sure you put a little bit more panhard bar into it too, so that you don't lose that side bite that you will lose. But sorry, I can't actually answer that question on that right rear. Sounds like I need to study up on this right rear load thing. Well, it's kind of what you... It's kind of what you touched on. I mean, taking load away, you're thinking you're going to take load away to get grip when the track gets slippery, but you're going to gain attitude, but you're actually going to spin the tires. You're going to roll, but you're not going to transfer. So right. that's why I think a common a common problem when it gets dry is to take rounds out of the right rear, and you actually, I think you hurt the right rear yeah. because you take anything. Sometimes when it gets dry, you need to actually put them in. Put turns into the right rear to get yeah. feet, feet deal and, and get more traction on that right rear tire. Yep, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. Uh, Joey, now I don't remember Joey's. This is pole. He was asking. We were talking about pole bars and adding an angle there and tuning okay. that one. This is about having too much angle and and yes, you can have too oh, much yeah. on the pole bar. You'll have too much instant and you won't be able to carry it down the straightaway. So definitely a, a tuning uh, tuning tool there is the angle for sure. 15 degrees is a very neutral angle. Common. Um, yeah. you, you get much above 18 degrees and the car is going to be a rocket ship instantly and it'll go away quickly. If you take less, you get down to 10 degrees, it might be a little lazy on, on coming off the corner, but it'll have traction later down the straightaway. Yeah, short track versus super speedway. Short track, more angle, super speedway, half mile long, or less angles. So. Yep. Okay, Brian, on, uh, on the IMCA modified, how much right rear height do you recommend? I shortened my right rear chain by a hole in the Weir's quick adjust limiter and noticed that when I got on the throttle in the corner, on the corner, it would pull the chain tight and give me a ton of forward traction. Well, I think there's a lot to that. Um, you know, that's kind of what we've talked about in the past, that you can tighten the chain down on the right rear and it definitely gives you traction. It might make it pretty sensitive, but, you know, what I recommend is I'd rather run a little bit more initial bar angle and limit the bar angle so that it, like you just said brian what you just did because i think you'll get more traction that way uh, limiting the, the chain of the only problem like i said if you get on a choppy racetrack or a rough racetrack it can get a little jerky and, and you know it'll hook that right rear tire a little too quick sometimes and, and make it lose the nose but uh, you know that's pretty common shortening that chain up on that right rear will definitely give you more traction off the corner. Yeah, he added there on that second one where he, he added a line there about skating on entry, and that's uh, definitely when you tie that right rear down, then you go into the corner and you let out of the gas, and that right rear chain gets tight on D-cell. It's trying to pick the right rear tire up, and then that's how you skate on entry. So 
Right rear chain's touchy subject. Um, okay. Well, nice to know you're watching there, Pat. I appreciate it. I hope you had a good time. I hope you had a good time up at 141. Oh, hell, I bet he had a great time. You guys had an extra night to not have to worry about races. What's better than one camping trip with Pat? Two. <laughs> uh, uh, Jim's wanting to tell you, Ryan, that you don't have enough travel. Alex, how important... Oh, we're actually over our time. Sorry. Uh, Alex, how important do you think it is to have an X on a stock car chassis? Car currently doesn't have one. What changes could I expect if I added one? Well, in my opinion, an X is a very important part to have in a race car because once again, without that X, the chassis is flexing quite a bit. And the more flex that you have, the more it actually takes it off the... Uh, um, and Billy, you're the last question we're going to do because we are going to be out of time. But anyway, the um, X is going to give you a little bit of rigidity. It's going to keep the... What it's going to do is it's going to keep the right front hook with the left rear and keep traction in the car. So I, I think an X is definitely a good idea. In my opinion, though, I wouldn't make it a perfect X. I would stagger it slightly, which means that the right front to the left rear would be one solid piece. My left front to my right rear would be two pieces, and they would be about six inches apart where they meet on the piece that went from the right front to the left rear. What's a good starting point on angle of the upper trailing arms on a metric car? Five degrees. From what I have seen, actually five degrees is probably a lot. Two degrees is probably more realistic. Um, uh, with what the rules allow us to do in, on, on those metric cars, it's, it's somewhat limited. If you can adjust it and go differently from what the rule, you know, depending on what your rules stay, five degrees wouldn't hurt you at all, but two degrees is pretty common. Uh, Billy, what ideas do you have to make the brakes not so sensitive on a hobby stock with a floater? Well, and you guys are kind of limited in what you can run for um, a brake pedal. Or, I don't even remember now if they opened that rule up and, and allow you guys to have a better brake system or not. Um, Biggest thing would be is there's no rule on what brake pads that you can actually run. So, you know, having a, a higher quality brake pad would probably be a big advantage. And like, as an example, like if our modifieds and our sport mods, we run a, a soft compound on the right front, a medium compound on the left front, and then heavy compounds on the rears. Now, I know some of the stock car, or some of the hobby stock guys that, um, and, and if you have a question on that, feel free to give uh, Brandon a, or Braden a call tomorrow at, at the shop. Uh, he's run a hobby stock a lot more and might have some more tips on what he did with his brakes when he was running a hobby stock. Uh, but Braden would be the guy to talk to if you call BHE. All right, guys. Excellent questions tonight. Great group, man. I was very impressed. We had a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to have to study up on my right rear loads and, and some more things for two weeks from now. And actually, it's going to have to be three weeks from now because in two weeks, it's going to be the 4th of July. So we're going to be on vacation. Well, I won't be on vacation. I'll be at a race someplace. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where I'll be at a race someplace, but I'll be at a race and in fact, I don't even know what the specials are. Come to think about it, I'll have to look at that tomorrow. But I'm sure I'll be at a race somewhere on the 4th of July. That's always a fun time, and I always enjoy going to the races there. We get an extra day of racing, and, and uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. Or I might just take the day off and hang out with the grandkids or some, something fun. I don't know. It'll be exciting, whatever we do. So we'll actually see you, or we will talk to you guys on the 11th. July 11th, it'll be three weeks from today. How about the prizes? Oh, yeah. 
we were going to draw some, since it's our 60th episode, I'm glad you mentioned that, Chad. I forgot all about that. Since it's our 60th episode, we're going to, Chad's going to draw some names. Uh, you explain how you're going to do that. And what I'll explain is we're going to have five Race Tech Info shirts, and Chad's going to have five Weir's Machine shirts, and he'll explain to you how we're going to do that. We're just going to throw all the names in a hat and randomly draw 10. So we'll, uh, my marketing people will reach out for the five Weir's Machine, and, and Bob's marketing people will reach out for the, the five RTI ones. So thanks, everybody, for, for the questions. Another awesome night. Oh, yeah. One last thing. 43 days to the Harris Clash. Can't forget that. 43 days. It's going to be here before we know it. So nice questions, guys. You guys all have a great night, and we'll see you in three weeks. Thanks, Chad. Thank you.